You're listening to episode 172 of the Writing Life podcast from the National Centre for Writing, a weekly podcast for anyone who writes. I'm Simon Jones. And I'm Steph McKenna. And it is the 12th of November, 2021, here in Norwich. Steph, what do we have on the show today? On today's show, we are welcoming Jennifer Ann Champion, who uh, describes herself as a poet, writer, educator, and cat obsessed, which I very much enjoy. And Jennifer was one of our Singaporean writers in residence. Um, and she is speaking to Rosie Carrick, who is a performance poet who we have worked with before. I believe she performed at City of Literature at Norfolk and Norwich Festival a few years ago. Yeah, so these residencies took place back over the summer. And due to obvious COVID-related reasons, these were remote residencies. So we couldn't have people coming to Norwich to stay in our nice little cottage on the Dragon Hall campus. So instead, we arranged residencies for them back in their own home. And we've had two podcasts already with the other Singaporean writers. So a couple of weeks ago, we had Sally Ann Lomas talking with Nuralia Noasid. And we also had Nasri Barawi in conversation with Vineet Lau. We'll uh, stick links down to those other podcasts down in the description. Something I really enjoyed about Jennifer's time with us as a writer in residence is that um, she's got an interest in the intersections of textile art and the written word. So a lot of her residency was actually spent embroidering and writing poetry to go alongside that embroidery. And you can find examples of her work over on our website, on our blog. Um, and she also provided a really useful uh, article of top five essential pieces of advice for fellow writers. Yeah, no, Rosie and Jennifer talk a lot about how her poetry and embroidery kind of come together and how you can combine completely separate art forms into something new and exciting. It's a really interesting conversation. And if you enjoy this conversation, um, you should also head over to our YouTube channel where we've got a recording of an event we held a couple of weeks ago called Stitching Stories, which also featured Jennifer. Um, and that was a really interesting conversation about how art and craft inform the way that we can write and tell stories in a more tactile way. So all of these events and conversations and articles link beautifully together. Yes, and uh, we will stick links to all of them down in the notes. Okay, so let's hand over to Rosie and Jennifer having a conversation back in the summer. Jennifer, welcome to the podcast. It's a pleasure to be talking to you. And I would say welcome to Norwich as well, except, of course, you're doing your residency from over there in Singapore. So it's <laughs> the evening for you in the morning for me. Thank you for having me, Rosie. Uh, I wish I could be there. Welcome. And I wonder, I know that you've been doing the residency. We spoke about a month ago I think didn't we I had a conversation and I think the residency being as it is over a distance is happening for a longer time it has uh, extended uh, by a month but I'm also really grateful for the extension because uh, the kind of work I proposed with embroidery and writing means that um, the time taken to make the pieces is extended as well so I'm really grateful for that um, but I think if I was actually there and staying for two months, I would start to miss my cat. It's, it's been really great to have family around, my craft stores around, uh, and to be able to do it here, to be honest. Mm, yeah, well, that's great. Have you found that, I was wondering, because of course, I suppose one thing about a residency, which is wonderful, although it does mean that you miss all of these things about your own life, is that you can devote yourself entirely to it. Whereas I guess when you're in your home, do you find that other bits of stuff keep cropping up and thinking, you know, must do this admin, must do that work. No, no, Jennifer, I'm on a residency. Stop it. Or is it, have you been able to keep the balance? I suppose that's where the extra month comes in perhaps as well. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, I think that there's definitely... A, a kind of balance but it's very organic so every day there is a point in my head where I go I need to do a little bit of residency work now um, mm -hmm. but I you're right that life also is able to kind of intrude into my world it's not like I would be able to do this hermetic thing and uh, shut everything out like you typically would for a residency. Although I don't know what is typical because this is my first residency as well. Um, so this sets the tone for any future residencies. <laughs> um, 
And, and I suspect I'm being quite spoilt uh, because people have been so kind to me, especially in terms of deadlines and getting things done. Uh, so I'd like to, you mentioned that your, you know, your focus is poetry and embroidery. So I suppose I would like to ask you to begin with how you first got into writing poetry. So the writing of poetry happened years ago, uh, sometime in 2012, 2013, I want to say. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I got into poetry slam. So uh, watching live poetry was what really got me into it more than studying it in school, which is what I also did at uni. I, I studied literature, general literature and um i wasn't taken in by poetry at all on the page but when i saw it not just performed live but also by um what i guess i would call working class people in singapore Mm. that made it so much more relatable to me the kind of content the kind of delivery that they were doing with poetry it wasn't what my professors would have seen as poetry worth studying, but I thought it was. Uh, and I could also see myself creating it um, in, the, in that particular context that they were doing. So I started dating a poet in the scene. Uh, he was a National Slam champion in my country named Li Jingyan. And he said something a bit stupid to me. He said, you know, you, you look like you write poetry. You, you look like you have a poet's face. Uh, do you write poetry? And, and I did not, but I lied and because I, I wanted to impress him. So I was like, yeah, 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 I write poetry. And all of the poems were bad. <laughs> they were just really, um, you know, you use these big, grand words and very much about trying to peel away the layers of myself by not hiding in language. And, and trying to get simpler and more universal. Mm, gosh, there's so much there to unpick. That's amazing. You know, uh, straight away, I, I totally get you with uh, live poetry versus poetry that you study. I actually yeah. started writing poetry when I was uh, seven or six or seven. And for a long time, I wrote lots of poems about like, flowers and feeling sad and all this business um but I really realized and I never I said we always study English literature at school and I never really um had this visceral reaction to poetry precisely because what you study in school is uh of another time by particular people generally sort of well-to-do white guys in uh, the UK at least same uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> great, good. Um, and you, it feels like, you know, it was something that I, something that really drew me to it as a child was the fact that I only needed a pencil and a piece of paper and my own brain. I didn't need any, you know, I, I grew up in quite a poor family, didn't need any extra stuff. Um, and and yet there was always this thing like poetry was a big sort of sphere over there that I was c- pulling at the sides of. And it was when I started going to poetry slams and live not even just poetry slams but I suppose seeing people contemporary poets really unpicking that and writing things that felt more conversation that felt conversational more immediate more about the business of real life but doing it in an incredibly beautiful way that I was like oh yeah poetry isn't just this thing that this very narrow educational system has taught me that it is And it was just so incredibly liberating. Uh, I mean, it's just, it's like having the veil lifted, isn't it, all of a sudden? There's definitely, I I definitely agree with you that there's definitely something special about seeing someone who is alive and breathing in front of you, um, embodying the poetry. Um, Especially since I think we're, at least for my generation and the, and the ones younger than me, we're an increasingly visual culture. We mm. like to to not just see the words on the page, but to see them in a person. Uh, that makes it more real and more vivid to us somehow, even if that person is just speaking words which themselves are creating pictures. Mm. Um, yeah, just the simple act of performing the poetry, I think, 
makes it come alive in a way that the textbook does not offer. Yeah. Do you think, though, sometimes something I really notice about poetry slams sometimes is that in the same way that sometimes language in a book, you know, text written down seems kind of doesn't have that quality of, of aliveness. I find that sometimes in with slam, well, actually, I suppose in all poets, um, you know, in different kind of groupings of poets, sometimes fall into particular styles of delivery, whether it's the very monotonous droning voice or, uh, and in slam poetry, there's often this kind of uh, style that can feel very performative. And now I'm going to take you up here and I'm going to drop you down there. By performative, actually, yeah, perhaps that's the wrong word. It feels very rehearsed. And and so something that I'm really interested in, poetry in performance, is where there is this sense of aliveness, where it doesn't feel like a kind of rehearsed and therefore um, not very what's the word natural, or honest. Yeah, or nat- natural and therefore honest kind of thing. I wonder how that is in Singapore and how you kind of experience that. Because for a long time, I wasn't even interested in in putting poetry in a book. I was so committed to performance, and I still am, and I love performing, but uh, as with you, I'm sure I've been through, I mean, you've sort of won so many slams, it's insane. You should be wearing a crown right now just for the interview. Um, I haven't won the yearly one, which is why I can't carry the the national poetry slam title. You have to win this one very special one that comes (laughs) not even every year, just whenever the person who holds the, the trademark for Poetry Slam decides when to have a competition. If you win that, you get that. Um, Let's see. Well, give me their email address. I'll send them an offer. They can't refuse. <laughs> they can come back with crown then. <laughs> we'll see. But yeah, is, um, is it something you notice there with this kind of style of delivery? or you so, know? so in Singapore, we haven't um, been able to perform since covid uh, very rarely do we get live performances, and but we do have live uh, online poetry readings, and that forces people, I think, to be a lot more, I suppose, honest and bare in front of their webcams. And and while I enjoy that, I do actually miss the grand. And here, something is happening, <laughs> and I'm going to take you. Over. I, I I do love that. Uh, movement and that kind of um, emphasis when it comes to storytelling. Maybe emphasis is not the word. What is the word I'm looking for? The gesturing of storytelling. Mm. Um, I miss it very much. So I guess it depends on what you're in the mood for and whether you can get it at the time. Uh, We're all itching to get back on stage to do that. Yeah, I mean, today is officially our sort of freedom day, the 19th of July, when things are supposed to be opening up, despite the fact that numbers are rising all the time. Uh, And and in fact, it's also the birthday of Vladimir Mayakovsky, who's a Russian revolutionary poet who I was just thinking of then, as you said that, because he's someone who, for me, having studied poetry for years, you know, throughout school, my undergraduate degree, when I was doing my MA, I read this poetry of his, and it was so big and uh, passionate and mm. I, I would listen to some recordings of him reading it and I've seen videos and he's so gestural and so um, well he, he's been described by someone at the time who's um, alive as you know watching a performance of his being like watching one drunken sailor shout across stormy seas to another um, so it's just this kind of and so I, I hear you with that kind of the presence, I guess, and it is about being present in it, isn't it? That's what you don't get on um, on the video. But So how about your embroidery then? Because it strikes me that that's another way in terms of sort of tangibility of poetry. I know that your, uh, you, your embroidery is, is has to do with separate from poetry, but also you have embroidered your poetry, the, the language itself. So I guess, how did you get into embroidery and how did this sort of marriage between the two forms come about? When I got into embroidery, it wasn't with the intention to marry my poetry to it. I think I was just exploring ideas of craft uh, for their own sake. And I did it because 
one, we're in the middle of a pandemic. We're all at home. We want to do things that are tech, tactile. Uh, you know, people going off and breaking, breaking, baking breads, um, <laughs> succulents, uh, gardening, all sorts of, of things you do with your hands, I think, because we miss touch. Mm. And I didn't always write, and I didn't always write poetry, but I have always done some form of sewing as a child. Like during math class, I would have like a bit of cross stitch in my lap. <laughs> sewing quietly and then all all the other students be like jennifer is sewing and then my teacher would just kind of look at me like yes she is but she's also being very quiet and that's a good (laughs) student Uh, so so sewing was something i i'd always done and i i hadn't done it for years i just suddenly felt like picking it up one day after a very stressful uh, day of teaching poetry and I didn't stop. So I, I, I've been sewing every day since, in the month, since the month of February and particularly doing uh, a form called needle painting, which is that kind of blended, almost painterly effect. And sometimes I would use it with poetry. I would use it as an ekphrastic thing. So it's like creating your own artwork to respond to. Mm. Um, but because I don't actually draw a lot of the the image references came from works that were in the public domain already. So, uh, like natural uh, portraits of, of uh, nature from like the eighteen hundreds, and then I would modify them a little bit, like do a flying fish, but give it legs. Mm, or, I've seen that. It's brilliant. It's just so great. Thank you. And how and be, they do seem very painterly. Sorry to interject here, but they. Uh, and it's are so beautiful. Anyone listening to this, if you check out Jennifer's Instagram, there's lots on there. It's Jennifer Ann Champion. Uh, and, and it seems, so how do you, maybe this is a stupid question, but it, uh, if, it, as you don't, if you don't draw yourself, how do you kind of translate what you're seeing into where do I put the stitches? How does it come together? Uh, there, um, there's, I mean, there is this magical thing called tracing paper. <laughs> <laughs> which I then uh, do the modifications on. I used to stitch the tracing paper directly onto the cloth, which Mm. made my stitches very uneven. And now I use things like carbon paper and dressmakers uh, carbon and all that kind of stuff. Um, But uh, this residency has been very much about learning how to make poetry and embroidery work together. So um, what I did, for example, with uh, the works of Lorena Balwa, who was an inmate in um, the Great Yarmouth Workhouse in the 1800s, was I took samplers she already had done, these huge letters, angry letters addressed to various people and royalty uh, and did blackout work with embroidery on the text. And it was both meditative and a, a use of the embroidery technique, but also my own poetry craft to not so much redact, but shape out a narrative which Lorena may or may not have intended with mm. the full text that uh, she had given. That sounds fascinating. It must give you such brilliant, unexpected results, sort of like, I guess, in a similar way to cut up poetry or something like that. Because the, the text itself that she had done, I mean, to, to embroider your thoughts quietly, and maybe you shouldn't do it quietly, but to embroider, <laughs> to embroider your thought, thoughts is to have an immense amount of confidence in, in what you are saying. Because you know that the investment of time just to get a letter onto a fabric um, is going to take infinitely longer than writing it with a pen or even saying it out loud. And Lorena had that confidence in her own words. And even then, those words were repetitive in many places, didn't always quite make sense. But she felt... And she had enough faith in herself to do that. And so it's 
for me, more than a hundred years later on looking at this, I'm thinking about how do I respect that, but also be playful in my own interpretation uh, and re re-embroidering of meaning onto um, her text. And do you find that it's made you rethink or reappraise your own way of writing in terms of mm. uh, thinking, I like this, but would I embroider it <laughs> or something like that? You know, would I like to keep this line if it came to the crunch? Would I be prepared to embroider this? You know, I'm definitely I more sparing. No, you're right. I'm definitely more sparing now and more economical when I think about my writing, especially if I'm going to embroider it. I'll think, do I really need this line? Because it's going to take me half an hour to get five or six words onto the text. Uh, so onto the fabric and um, yeah, yeah, you're definitely right there. I, I am more I mean, economical. I it's, it's remarkable to think, obviously we use text so much more now than we did, you know, 20, 25 years ago. And e even when we're just texting friends, we can't even be asked to write out words in full. You know, we go into text speak. Um, mm -hmm. so, so yes, the prospect of actually um, embroidering each one um yeah amazing and how are you feeling now about the project when is it the end of this month that the residency ends now in about two weeks yes uh and i suspect i will not even be done by then because uh like the lorena balwa text that i was talking about her full text it measures two meters long i was <sighs> able to print it onto a fabric that is 1.5 meters uh, and I'm only halfway done. <laughs> so there's still a lot, a lot more to go. Uh, not even considering if I want to do more visual uh, things like abstract patterns on top of the blackout work that's already been done. Well, I think sometimes that's the great thing about the residency. You know, you go in thinking, this is what I will achieve in this time. And actually what it does is open the door for you to begin a project and really get into the thick of it, isn't it? It's about having the time and space to do that. To explore, yes. I, I've really appreciated that. And also to, to consider context that you wouldn't, because um, I was very mindful about wanting to engage with Norwich culture but in an embroidery uh, sense. And I would not have heard of Lorena Balwa if not for this residency, if not for uh, Kate, who, who is in charge of the residency, kind of telling me, by the way, uh, this is someone who you should check out. Um, and I was so stunned when I saw the work and, and how forceful it was even though it was on fabric because people mm. look at fabric and they think that's a that's a very soft domestic subtle kind of art it is still very much tied to this sphere of domesticity um and to see it actually being very loud uh and to drawing attention to itself in a in an artifact that is actually quite old was eye-opening for me mm, yeah it's such a wonderfully subversive act to to do it in the first place and then to mm. to find this old artifact and and to do something new with it mm. yeah I haven't heard of her I was wondering where where you had heard of her actually but so initially you had been going to you knew that you were going to work with embroidery and poetry but you hadn't quite put your finger on it is that right and then Kate suggested Yes. Ah, oh, how marvellous. That's great. And so what's next for you? I know that you have applied to do a PhD, creative writing PhD. MFA. And I think you're still... Oh, is it? Yeah. Okay. Ba okay. Baby PhD. <laughs> <laughs> um, collection of letters. Um, and you're waiting to hear back about funding, I think. But what 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 are your kind of aims with that? I know that you're very... Um, passionate about education, po poetry and education. And I wonder whether that has something to do with what you said about when you first felt really engaged with poetry, it coming from this place of 
kind of working class voices in media voices or whether that's something quite you know separate to you i think that a lot of the poetry in singapore the slam poetry we have our model for that in the poetry we see online and much of it does come from america and so when i was deciding on uh on doing an mfa it was quite important to me to do it in a center of spoken word uh the, the options for me there were melbourne or new york uh melbourne of course is much closer to me and and i've never been to america uh but i decided that america would be this great adventure if i could get in i didn't think that i would <laughs> Uh, so so now is the shock i'm still kind of processing the shock of having been accepted um and i'm very much on tenter hooks in figuring out if i can actually go or not because it's very dependent on on whether i get a scholarship uh mm. still checking my email every hour to hear <laughs> of the results getting nightmares as well because it's it's getting really quite late to apply for the visa um beyond immersing myself in the form that i have loved for a very long time i suppose my thesis would be to continue on this idea of craft and embroidery and poetry because i mean not just so much not just tying my embroidery to my poetry but also exploring stories of embroidery uh in singapore and in terms of whatever takes my my fancy um so for example in singapore i i went through our newspaper archives and i found an article on a man in the 40s who after his job would go in the evenings to sit by this place called uh Northbridge Road by a very old cinema called Capitol and he would sit on the street and just embroider and then mm. crowds would form around him to watch him or purchase his work or get these sort of quick impromptu lessons i like to think of him as singapore's first embroidery busker <laughs> and it's 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 not really like um a grand performative gesture of sewing and to draw a crowd anyway with doing this quiet thing which gave him joy uh mm. because he was a tailor as well in his daytime so imagine sewing in the day sewing at night <laughs> sleep repeat sewing in the day sewing at night uh, yeah. um he must have had very nimble fingers yes yes <laughs> yeah i've never seen anything like that you know you often particularly that there there's a guy in brighton where i'm from who does these beautiful paintings it around different places in the town and of course we become and you know and i suppose it's similar perhaps you see it a lot obviously a lot on a lot of the bridges in paris and so on you see people painting the glorious views and people coming up but you're right even though painting too is in some ways a, a kind of small and gradual thing it can't be done all at once it's still much more immediate feeling it doesn't have that tiny delicate stitch by stitch of of somebody doing some embroidery an embroidery busker i love that i i love it too i i wish i could find more information about this man um and the irony of going away from singapore to work on that story <laughs> is a bit strange uh but yeah i'm still very much in a a free explorative place when it comes to that and and gathering stories. Oh yeah, well it's about taking something into a new context as well, isn't it? You know, yeah. about being in a new context in order to explore something that perhaps is close to you can make all the difference I think sometimes. Mm. Um so in a moment um I'm going to ask you to um share a poem with us if you'd be so kind before we before we finish chatting today but before we do that i'd really love to know if you have any any red hot tips for any other writers or potential embroidery buskers <laughs> or or just you know or, or i guess particularly people going to perform live or you know anything like that that in your experience as a writer and a performer you would pass on 
I would say to, to keep yourself open to the art forms that come into your life. Um, don't feel like you have to be dedicated to just one thing. Because more often than not, um, you know, when, when we think about our identities, we feel this need to be very secure in saying we are this one thing when we could be uh, multitudinous. But also the advantage of that is that your art forms can inform each other. So don't just be a writer sitting at your desk and uh, doing the discipline of, of just writing. Go out and be curious about, it doesn't even have to be an art. It can be a, a science. It can be any subject field. And also be an armchair expert about that because that information is very useful to bring back to your craft. Um, I especially tell my, I teach very young people, like in their teens, early teens. And one, my exercises are very much about not just writing, but also drawing. I'll tell them you don't have to be a, a good uh, artist, but I just want you to think about what you're writing embodied in physical details and to observe mm. those details by drawing. Um, so I definitely encourage taking up any as much art as you can, art forms as you can that make you curious about life because they will sharpen your ability to observe things in new ways. Yeah, that's such great advice. And, and actually great advice outside of being an artist, just as being a human being. I think we're so keen, as you say, because it feel, makes us feel neat and boxed in to being saying, you know, what am I? I am a poet. I am a mother. I am a wife. I am a this. And of course, circumstances change. And if you're not one of those things anymore, you suddenly feel like you've failed or you've lost yourself. Whereas if you go through life thinking, you know, I am a human being having this experience at the moment. And at some point it might change to another one and another one. And being open to that, as you say, it just suddenly, yeah, you're not tied down, you're open. And yeah. Um, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks so much for that. And what poem are you going to share with us today? Okay. Um, so this is a draft, to be honest, uh, that I've been working on. And so it may not come out finished in this particular way that I've read it, but it is a piece of embroidery I've been working on, which is meant to be a protective um, piece of wall hanging because when I was looking at Lorena Balwa's work again, there was something that, that felt like she needed desperately to say something in, in the time with the problems that she was facing, which is very different from the kind of wall hangings we see in, in my part of the world, which are more protective, more talismanic, to bless the home. So I wanted to produce something that was in between because Singapore, at yeah, from May until now, we've, we've kind of been going through a lot of reckoning with uh, race and racism in this country uh, and, and a, a deep disappointment and heartbreak when it comes to how uh, our leaders should lead us. And so this poem is about that, and it utilizes a moon and hand motif because our Singapore flag actually has a moon, a crescent moon and five stars, which stand for the ideals of the country. So this poem is called To the Idealists. It's always about the raindrop, not the storm, not the individual sad story, not the long arm of history, a surface made threadbare, a clouded eye, a sadness with no reckoning. All your life you faced a hoisted moon and their ideals as stars so tiny you cannot make them out. All your life, hand over heart to this painted crescent, moon loved still, love to stillness, perpetual virgin they maintain when it has been growing with your pain. All your life is precious even when they say it is not. They blame your light, your shadow, your tone, the thunder. But look at her, 
not the portrait they made and can never raise high enough to reach her heights. How she comes and goes and becomes again this pulse in our sky, teasing time, a bomb they say we must never let explode. And yet, what truth might splatter, stain a star you can finally see. What love could shine through if we permit the night its entry points. All your life, holding your breath, your words, your comebacks, come back before you retreat so far into yourself, you cannot answer why you love this country and its anxieties. Look at her, this child within, waiting in the wings. Beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. I'm so Thank glad you. that we got the opportunity for you to share a poem. Is this, I think I saw, is this an embroidery piece that you started working on the image? And this is a piece yes. of writing to go with it. So will the writing be embroidered too when you have, when you, it, it will, and the poem will be shorter because, again, <laughs> it takes time to put every line in there. I think I've got 20 lines in this poem. This is when it really pays to get an intern. I think, I think that, would be, that would be torturous, possibly not ethical. It's yeah, I was going to say, it may, may run counter to the kind of, yeah, the, the, the philosophy of doing it in the first place. But, mm. oh, well, editing it is then. Um, Jennifer, thank you so much for talking to me today. It's been brilliant to hear more about your work and I can't wait. I think that you are planning to send one of the finished pieces to to Norwich. Yes. I can't wait to see it and um, enjoy the final two weeks of your residency and I look forward to seeing more of your work in the future. Thank you. Thanks for listening and many thanks to Rosie and Jennifer. If you have questions about this or anything else that we're doing, you can find us over on Instagram and Twitter at Writer Centre. You can join our Facebook page and if you head to our website at nationalcentreforwriting.org.uk, you can sign up to our newsletter, join our Discord community and check out all the other events we have coming up. Please do rate, review and subscribe to the podcast because it helps other people to find us. Thanks again. Keep writing and we'll catch you on the next episode. Music